The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing us under of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Luke chapter 1, verses 74 to 75 to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit, and belief in the truth. Second Peter 2 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Romans six fourteen, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him who are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Romans 8.10 And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Before we start our Bible study today, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, be sure you have named your sins privately to God the Father. First John 1 John 1.9 is what we are to use now in order to prepare ourselves. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now after you do that, you will be in fellowship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to learn Bible doctrine from the Word of God. However, if you are an unbeliever, you have never personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The issue you are facing is not confession of your sins. It is faith alone in Christ alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for taking us all this afternoon to this gathering once again to be able to learn more truths from your word, the modern manna for our soul. We thank you, Father, for the good health you have given us and we're enjoying at this time which indicates that your plan for our lives is not yet over and that you want us to execute your protocol plan by spiritually growing up to the pleroma stage 
which is the capacity stage, capacity for life, for happiness, and for blessings. We pray now that you give us the concentration and motivation. So we are going to assimilate your doctrine you're going to teach us this afternoon or this day through the teaching ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good day everyone. Welcome once again to our Bible study today. And uh, we will continue our discussion on our topic, the unique spiritual life of the believer in Jesus Christ. Now we are concentrating right now on the spiritual freedom and responsibility. We uh, stopped yesterday on the different principles. So let me quote again the principle number one. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a license to serve. That's uh, the first principle. Then the second principle is grace does not mean we are to be lazy. The third principle God does not help those who help themselves. Grace means we choose to receive God's help on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Of course, beginning in the Garden of Eden, God created everything to provide for the need of man. And here is an outline for you to understand our objective. We are going to study how to solve the problems of confusion related to the overt activities of Christians. And then uh, I took up number one, the four things not to do when you disagree with the pastor's teaching concerning overt activities. All of these come from different backgrounds and different viewpoints. And many times, we are so stiff in tradition and prejudice that it's very difficult for us to accept a different opinion. Now, that is okay. But what becomes a problem is when you refuse to accept what the Bible teaches on any given doctrine. Now, we will study that. Never violate your own conscience. And number two, do not cause discord among believers in the Bible study group or local church in which you find yourself. Number three, do not slander or gossip about the pastor with whom you disagree. Live quietly if necessary, but do not slander the pastor. Number four, do not under any circumstances stop your spiritual growth. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Second Peter 3.18. And no matter what happens in your life, you should never, ever stop your spiritual growth. Let me emphasize on that. So number one, we're going to study four things to do when you disagree with the pastor's teaching concerning overt activities. Number two, we're going to study four classifications of overt activities. We are going to study what the Bible says and calls and identifies as sin. We are going to study doubtful things. We are going to study taboos. We are going to study legalism. Then, number three, we are going to study Roman numeral number three, four conditions of a believer's conscience. 
Number one, there is a believer who has a seared conscience. You might say, no conscience. Number two, there is a believer who has a weak conscience. Three, there is a believer who has, because of religious influences, a legalistic conscience. Four, and then there is a believer who, through spiritual growth, has a biblical conscience. And we will describe in detail what a conscience is, and we will study these four categories of consciousness of the conscience related to the believer in Jesus Christ. And then we will study number four, the four spiritual laws related to the believer's overt activities. Now one here is called the law of liberty. The other one is called the law of love. The third one is the law of expediency. And the fourth one is called the law of supreme sacrifice. Then we will study number five, four solutions for the confusion related to the Christian's overt activities. Number one is grace recovery. Number two is spiritual growth. Number three is mental attitude dynamics. And number four is a biblical scale of values. And then number six, we're going to study four areas of authority to protect the believer in regard to the confusion of overt activities. Number one, parents. Number two, establishment. Number three, Bible doctrine or Bible teaching. And four, volition. And then number seven, we will study four areas of danger concerning the confusion of overt activities. Number one, the danger of arrogance in the strong believer. Number two, the danger of distraction in the believer with a weak conscience. Number three, the danger of a false concept of spirituality in the legalistic believer. Four, the danger of a false concept of salvation in the presentation of the gospel. Now, that is where we're going in this series. And I hope you are challenged to listen consistently. This is a very difficult subject for many people, and it takes a lot of explanation. And sometimes people just want these questions answered point blank without any explanation. I do not think that's fair to the communicator. I do not think that is fair to the scripture itself. So we have to go back to the first book in the Bible and begin with the first man and woman to understand the premise to answer these questions. So let's go back to the book of Genesis. Okay? Open your Bible now to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, by the way, takes us back to the beginning of human history. In the first two chapters, we see a perfect environment created by a perfect God, and over and over again, God looked at what He had made and said, it is good. Now in this perfect environment, God placed perfect man and perfect woman and gave them, listen carefully, the gift of freedom. So the name of this series is Spiritual Freedom and Responsibility. He gave them the gift of freedom. Now, to make the freedom real, God gave the man and woman real choices. And so, in the Garden of Eden, 
there is a test of the human will. Now, in the first part of lesson one, and probably in lesson two, we're going to explain why at this point in human history, we now have tremendous problems. We're going to explain why man is in a mess that he is, and how God solved the problem before time began, and he provided the solution. Now, first of all, we have to see the creation of the first man and woman. We have to see that God truly gave them the gift of freedom and he also gave them responsibility. We will see the first test of human volition. We will see the first problem in human history. We will see the first promise of a grace solution. There is always a solution. There's always an option in the plan of God. And as long as you are alive, there are options in your life. So, let us begin in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And we are studying the creation of the first man and woman. So, let's get a point. Then we will read Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The first man and woman were created in God's own image, right? They were designed for accomplishment, engineered for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. So, read Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So God created man and woman, and he created them in his own image, which means we have the ability to think, we have the ability to make decisions. They were designed for accomplishment. They were engineered for success, and they were endowed with the seeds of greatness. They had soul, spirit, and body, according to Genesis 2, verse 7. When God gives a human being the spark of life, it signifies that God has a purpose for that life. Listen to Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. Actually, it says, he breathed into their nostrils the breath of lives, which indicates, according to First Thessalonians, both soul, spirit, and body. Now listen to Isaiah 45, 5 to 7. I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I formed the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all of these things. The purpose of this verse is to tell us that when God gives the spark of life to any human being, he has a purpose for that human being. Now, the next point is the fact that the essence of the first man and woman included body, soul, human spirit, and the ability to think, to make decisions, and to, to take action. And you can see that in the first chapters of Genesis. So, 
Let's stop and think about the creation of the first man and woman. They are body, dust of the ground, soul and spirit, the breath of lives. They had human life, the spark of life, nishama. They had self-consciousness, mentality, volition, conscience, and emotion. And we will see that they developed their conscience. And therefore, this was the creation of man. And I might add, they were innocent. And they were perfect in the beginning, like everything else that God created. And we will stop there. We'll continue this tomorrow. Don't forget to follow this discussion on the spiritual freedom and responsibility. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let us spend the closing moments of our Bible study today describing salvation, describing that which the unbeliever does not have or is not aware of. It's time, if you are an unbeliever this day, that you be aware of what Jesus Christ offers to you. He offers eternal life. God so loved the world that He gave His only uniquely born Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Of course, everybody wants eternal life. So if you want it for real, if you want the eternal life that God promises, you must understand how Christ brings it to you. First of all, He appeared as God and man. That is who Jesus Christ is. And then He came for one single purpose, and that was to die for you. To die, that, is, that was His mission, so that we might have fellowship eternally with God, and how would that work? He went to the cross. God imputed to him all the sins of all mankind, including all of yours. And on that cross, God judged Jesus Christ for your sins. All that God is asking you is that you believe in what Christ has done on the cross. The work of salvation. He died for you. So, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, we have been saved by grace through faith. This salvation is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So I pray that you give this great consideration because it is your life. And you must know what you are headed for eternal condemnation or eternal life. The choice is all yours. Let us pray. And now, Father, we thank you for the clarity of who we are and what we must be, what you require of us, and we pray that as we continue in our temporary life here on earth, we will keep in mind what our priorities are never forsaking or leaving them, and never becoming anything less than salt that is of savor. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Good. Uh.